Welcome back, Chameleons, to another video of the Travelling with Aspie series. As your little tour guide of Mini Aspie, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Aspie Answers. I'm all about creating and advocating or navigating through life with mental health, autism, and also now my new diagnosis that has been finally cleared up, adult ADHD. I do some travel with Father Live, you've seen, as well as some challenges, just to let you guys know who has just popped on my channel. So, also now, while I'm being joined by Father Live, while we've been doing these traveling with SB series down the South Island of the winter edition even though they're running off like some of the ones that I've been planning right now I hope you're enjoying these and actually learning a bit of stuff like I said because obviously in the long run New Zealand is well known for its heritage culture history and some little gems that are hidden around New Zealand that you can actually visit and sightsee for yourself so if you do let me know in the comment section below and also hopefully in the near future Father Lion and I will be doing some more travels who knows or even maybe to surprise you a few challenges along the way so stay tuned for that if you're into any of those or let me know if you're going to want to see more of either lie on the channel let me know also because I'm hoping to try and invite him on to do some other bits and pieces that I hope to plan in future not just the challenges and everything of sorts but maybe a quick little you know get to know him tag or something if you want to know him more as a partner in crime but this is a continuation on the Nelson trip before we head back so to speak even though we are running out of time back on plan of what we were trying to do for the line I because obviously the South Island I this was my first time and we didn't hardly you know see all of it as you will for those three weeks that we planned to get away but as I said you need maybe a good month or two probably if you really want to re explore into the intent areas of where you want to be so this is a quick history background about like as it reads of the Nelson's history part three of the Nelson trip hopefully just to give you guys a bit of a history lesson slash educate you all about what Nelson's all about so stay tuned for it let's travel back in time shall we I'm going to do a flashback about a lady named Nita Nelson oh, this was well known in the 30s as the lady in red and this is a part of the Nelson history or shall we say so as I said before this is a quick read back based on this flashback of the freewheeling girl in red Nita Roslyn as the ship Sultan Star docked in Auckland a diminutive woman in red wheeling a bike stood out among the disembarking passengers because obviously she was well known as Lady in Red. So the very first image that I posted up is Nita Roslyn with a bike in Nelson. She kept her bike in her bedroom each night and assisted a breakfast tray to be left outside the door of her room adding to her air of mystery of who she really was. She was destined or destined to make headlines around New Zealand in the following months when she came aboard to New Zealand. She was known at times as the singer of a wheel. This was Manchester-born Nita Roslin. Variety show performer, intrepid traveller, gifted self-promoter and personal mystery as I mentioned earlier. Her nickname was the Girl in Red because of her scarlet uniform that she used to wear of a close-fitting cap, button jacket and skirt, cycling gaiters and boots as you can see in the picture below you or above you. She started her ventures in the early years of 1930s biking around Britain with a well publicised five shillings to her name. Having completed that tour she's been presented with a sturdy new bicycle by the British Cycles, Motorcycles and Traders Union in the year of 1934 or at the 1934 Olympia Hall Trade Show in London. In March 1935 she was out to conquer New Zealand. Nita's tour of New Zealand was a great success and she was a gifted self-publicist. Nita's tour of New Zealand was a great success and was obviously known for, as I said before, as a traveller, a mistress, mysterious person versus everything else. Nita was a quaint looking person who never took a cap off and was never seen wearing anything but a red uniform festooned with souvenir buttons and pins as you can clearly see in the illustrations I'm posting. She met the mayors of town she visited and stayed in private homes but her host got no closer to knowing her than anyone else. She kept the bike in her bedroom each night and did as I said to leave a breakfast tray outside her bedroom door sort of thing every morning. On stage however it was different. She told reporters the theme of her cycle marathon was to prove variety wasn't dead in spite of the talkies of the town. In a planned ahead series of the performances at town theatres ironically in between movie showings she would sing delightfully in several languages accompanied by her banjoli cross between a banjo and a ukulele tell funny stories of her travels and hand out six penny photo cards of herself audience admission was a mere silver coin each the evening post described her after her opera house appearance in three words pep personality and pluck if everyone was curious about the girl in red although she was actually 31 at that time was Nita Roslin who 
real name? Had she really cycled all around England and much of the rest of Europe alone? What about wild female problems along the way? And did she have an extra weird uniform or did she wash and wear the same one over and over again? Nita Roslin with admirers in Queensland, she never took her cap off and was never seen wearing anything but a red uniform for with seven and buttons and pins. Obviously, it's a photo above, above you here. Could it to her publicity, Nita's fifth nifty new bike featured lever brake and totally geared rear hub, full chain guard, saddlebag carriers and a carbide lamp. It carried her over foreign roads in all the weathers and all times of the day. Along her route, the bike was often displayed in shop windows and her name went to ads for Rayleigh, BSA and other brand new models. In Wairua, Nita received the week old news of her mother's death back in Manchester, but undaunted she kept travelling on. From town to town and stage to stage, she went until on December 4th, 1935, her wheel slipped on some loose metal down the Whangamua Hill in Nelson. She fell heavily, suffering concussion and contusion. As she rested in Nelson Hospital, a new rumour has flown that it was said that the girl in red had been asked mask as a man and a spy that secret maps were hidden in the handlebars of her bike. These whispers just made Nita more fascinating to the members of the public. Obviously, by me also, this is Nita in her later life with husband Frederick Freestone Phillips. She died in Queensland in the year of 1978. So, bound next for Tasmania and Australia, Nita Rosalind left New Zealand in the year of 1936 and apparently vanished. But she had it. She'd simply settled down. After having toured in the total of Spain, Norway, Sweden, South America, Canada, USA, New Zealand and Australia, she finally alighted in Hervey Bay, Queensland. Possibly in Brisbane, she had met Fred Frederick Freestone Phillips, a 44-year-old farmer and World War One veteran. In 1939, they were then married. She died in the year of 1978. Frederick was died four years later. Rosalind had indeed been named his real name. Her English parents were Albert Rosalind and Mary Scholes. In a memoir describing her days of fame, the girl in red had written, I had had accidents, a broken jaw and head injuries. I have been without food for two days. I have cycled 105 miles in a day and gone straight onto the stage to earn my way. For the first few weeks, I suffered agony from cramped limbs and often I had to be carried from the metal table because my legs had locked in. But now I'm remarkably strong. Dangerous she'd face included the knife building hotel invaders in Brazil, earthquakes in Chile, distinctive in a red uniform, Nita had her caused a stir in Ireland where she was thought to be a communist. However, her quote was, I've met all sorts of people, sometimes distinguished people in mansions, sometimes poverty stricken people in the slums and I've enjoyed it immensely. Today's Nita's famous red bike hangs on display in the Hervey Bay Historical Museum in Nelson. So this quickly ends a real short brief piece about what I can find on Nita Nelson and hopefully I'll bring you out some more of the mystery or shall we say history of Nelson. So stay tuned for that and I'll be back with you shortly. The Church on the Hill now. Nelson's landmark cathedral now stands proudly on Church Hill. The first church was a tent erected when Bishop Salwin visited in 1842. It was replaced with a simple converted wooden building bought from the New Zealand Company. The Anglican Church bought an acre of land at the summit of the hill in 1848 and in June 1850 the foundation stone of a purpose-built church was laid. The new Christ Church was dedicated on 14th December 1851 and its rapidly expanding congregation saw it enlarged in 1859 and later again in 1866. In September 1858, Queen Victoria issued letters patents establishing Nelson as a bishop's diocese or see, thereby making Nelson a city. The 105th anniversary, 50th anniversary of the letters patent and the, of their arrival, Nelson was marked in September, October 2008 and February 2009. Nelson's first bishop, Edmund Hobhouse, was consecrated in England in September 1858. He was empowered to make an existing or future church, the Cathedral Church of the Nelson Diocese, and the Church of the Hill assumed the unofficial status of the cathedral. In 18, 1887, Bishop Andrew Suter made its status official, saying the people of Nelson had accepted it as such. By 1883, the old wooden church needed extending again, and while some wanted to build a new cathedral, it was decided in 1886 to start a further expansion. The new Christ Church Cathedral was consecrated on 16th February 1887. An earthquake in 1893 damaged the wooden spire, and concerns about its stability saw the demolition of the spire in the tower in 1916. In 1920, the city engineer condemned the building as a menace to the public, and further major repairs were undertaken after the fire struck in that very same year. It was definitely time for a new cathedral, and after preliminary plans were approved, the foundation stone was laid in August 1925. The elaborate English Gothic design of the cathedral was to be built in Takaka marble. Work was suspended in 1932 during the Great Depression, with the partially built marble nave being closed in by a roof and by a temporary ceiling. The chancel of the old cathedral was moved and joined onto the front of the new structure. This first stage of the new cathedral was dedicated by Bishop William Sadlier on 3rd December 1932. The plan 
plan was modified in an attempt to save money and work was stopped again by the outbreak of World War II. It was not until February 1957 that a simplified plan to complete the cathedral using concrete was approved. It drew howls of protest including criticism of how the proposed tower would look from Trafalgar Street. The Nelson Evening Mail declared, quote, change design can't compare with the most commanding ecclesiastical site, statistical site in New Zealand. We're uh, apparently to be satisfied with the second best. The controversial plan was approved in September 1957, however, and fundraising then began. Work started in May 1964 and the new cathedral was dedicated on 28 May 1967. Cathedral became debt free in 1971 and was so stay tuned. Peter Sutton on 14 April 1972. Today, the concrete sections of the cathedral, particularly tower, are deteriorating and the church again faces an expensive repair project. And obviously, based on this, uh, you will see some images of what I've got or video based on this cathedral and more. And once again, as I said, most of where I've taken the photos and videos will be listed in the description box below, along with also the map or what have you, as well as any other given information in the description for you to decide if you want to travel or not. So sit tight and relax. I'll be back with you shortly. So this one you may have seen in my earlier video piece of part one of the road trip to Nelson NZ, which is the Christchurch Cathedral that is in Nelson. Don't get it mucked up that it's located in Christchurch, hence the title of the name of this cathedral. However, it's good to think that Christchurch Cathedral in Nelson is on the New Zealand's South Island that is determined to be a work in progress. It's fr frankly odd appearance is a result of its own heritage and history in itself. It's reached its current shape and style throughout the earthquakes, fires and not a little controversy here and there that you hear about. In the year of 1842, within a year of the establishment of what became the town of Nelson, Bishop George Selwyn arrived with a tent which he planted at the top of what is now known as Church Hill, hence the Church Hill steps that you may have seen me posted as well, which I'll again be returned in 1851 to dedicate the replacement water church as Christ Church. In the year of 1920, well, this structure was enlarged and altered in 1859 and 18 1896 and again when it was inaugurated as a cathedral in the year of 1887. The spire was damaged by an earthquake in the year of 1893 and the tower demolished was unsaved or doomed deemed to be unsafe in the year of 1921 shortly before the building was further damaged by the fire. In 1927 however an ambitious new stone gothic cathedral has begun the, to the designs by or of, of Frank Peck in 1863 about 1931 which he was a British artist trained by Sir Aston Webb who had immigrated to New Zealand in the year of 1915. Maybe the same Frank Peck who has designed Petwood. Grace Maple's house at Woodhill Spa, Lincolnshire. Peck's design would have looked magnificent but hardly, hardly any work had been begun. Then the Murchison earthquake of 1929 to lead to the title building regulations and construction that came to a halt in the year 1932. The result was that PNA stopped abruptly and clearly level. A temporary roof was installed and the previous wooden chancel attached to the east end of the building. A simplified design of 1954 by Ron Munston Muston brought a sense of closure and practically to the interrupted design process. Munston used reinforced concrete face ground marble to complement Peck's marble blocks. The dominant feature is the tower, a whole a tall spare essay and light weight gothic much more adventurous than Peck's orthodox gothic reveal design. Not everyone liked it however in the Nelson Evening Mail basically rumble we are apparently to be satisfied with the second bit. The cathedral was completed in 1967 and consecrated once it became clear of debt in 1972. Of course it doesn't look complete. Peck's cathedral proved to be unbuildable on its totally vulnerable site but perhaps one day it might be possible at least to complete the nave. A medieval cathedral stood incomplete for many centuries. Colon Puss in 1473 was finished in the year of 1880. Bristol interrupted it. The reformation was eventually completed in 1888. The first stone of Mullen Cathedral was laid in 1386 and construction ended in 1965. So the words say never say never. Below you also is shown to be basically the Christchurch Cathedral, the church steps, centre of the community. Meteor of the church steps is often heard in Nelson and the steps from the bottom of Trafalgar Square at its intersection with Trafalgar Street to the top of Pekimai or Church Hill 
and the cathedral have been the rallying point for gatherings of every occasion in the city since its early colonial days. Baldy themselves had long used Pikimai as a fortified path but unaware of its use by Māori, the New Zealand company recognised the hill's strategic position when it arrived in 1841 and claimed it for its own administrative base. Before long the hill was the centre of the newly emerging, emerging colony housing not only immigration barracks for the newly arrived settlers but also the post office, the hospital team, the court house and the offices of the examiner newspaper with various paths worn as settlers moved about their business on the hill. The most direct path from Trafalgar Street at its intersection with Selwyn Place or as it's known for Trafalgar Square to the top of the hill was formed following the 1843 Wairu Afray in which local settlers and iwi were killed during a dispute over land at Wairu in Marlborough. Fearful of reprisal attacks by the local Maoris, a fort was built on top of the hill and settlers quickly formed a path as they scrambled up the hill to take refuge at night. In 1848, however, the hill was transferred to the Church of England, which had had held services on the hill since 1842. Wanting to provide easier access to the steadily expanding Christchurch, later Christchurch Cathedral, the Nelson Board of Works, the precursor to the Nelson City Council, and the church wardens cooperated to build three flights of wooden steps over the dirt path in 1858. The new steps quickly became the preferred gathering point for the growing colony, and many of the events held there were captured on camera. One of the earliest images of an event on the steps was taken in 1863 when Nelson celebrated the marriage of Edward Prince of Wales later Edward VIII or seven to Princess Alexandra of Denmark. Later the successful rescue of passengers and crew of the ill-fated immigrant ship the Queen Bee was commemorated with a Thanksgiving service on the steps in 1877 and in 1887 the 50th jubilee of Queen Victoria was marked by a procession and gathering at the top of Trafalgar Street and on the steps of an estimated 8,000 people. At the turn of the century the city both bewailed and welcomed back local troops from the Boer War and in 1905 photographer F.N. Jones drew a crowd when he drove his horse and buggy up the steps a feat he later repeated so it could be captured as a moving image which was subsequently shown in cinemas around the world however the wooden steps had quickly became dangerous growing slippery in wet weather being overgrown with weeds and rotting in places ongoing improvements and repairs over the ensuing decades since their construction failed to alleviate continuing calls for their replacement with the new steps and permanent materials but it wasn't until Nelson the philanthropist Thomas Curthorn stepped into the debate in the middle of 1911 that plans for new steps were finalised it had been suggested for several years that these new steps would be suitable as a public memorial to one of two recently deceased Nelson notables. Albert Pitt, who had been prominent in military government and local affairs, had died in 1906 and Francis Task, a former city mayor and legislative councillor was who died in 1910. However, in both cases it was eventually decided to erect memorial gate at the northern and the southern entrances to Queen's Gardens. Acknowledging the need for safer, more durable steps and the opportunity to combine with ongoing efforts to tidy up and beautify Churchill and entrance and enhance the cathedral, Thomas Cawthorne offered to cover the cost involved himself and to present the steps of the city. He also offered to help pay for the removal of trees on either side of the steps and the planting of flowering shrubs in their place. At the same time he undertook to fund the continuation of the Stankonians and chains along the unprotected sections of the Rocks Road seawall. Work began on the steps in August 1912 like Cream Tonga Bay Granite, New Zealand's only truly true granite, was specially quarried from a newly commissioned quarry in what is now part of the Abel Tasman National Park and shipped to now at the time it was thought the granite hardened with exposure to the atmosphere and sunlight through this later shown not to be the case. Two other known structures of Tonga Bay granite remain standing the truss gates at Nelson's Queen's Garden and the former public truss build. The steps were designed by Arthur Reynolds Griffin and constructed by Mrs J and A Wilson Limited of Wellington. Griffin was a Nelson architect at the time who was responsible for designing the Nelson Institute building in Hardy Street that is later known as the Public Library and the New Zealand School of Fishery and the Plunkett and Rest Room in Trafalgar Square currently now glass studio flying daisy. They were unusual in, their, in that their design represented elements of gothic church architect, church architect and not usually seen in a public way and were described by the colonists as a massive and imposing structure which will be in every way in keeping the beautiful eminence is to adorn. The cons they consisted of, of three double flights of steps separated by formal landings and five formal landings and decorative gardens long since filled in and made into viewing balconies and rows 11.5 metres from Trafalgar Street to the top of the hill. The steps were flanked by low walls with balance straight that is now gone and stone pillars topped with decorative metal fleur de layers capping. Six of the pillars were originally fitted with gas lamp stand. These were then removed and three electric lamp stands installed in the centre piece of the steps sometime prior to 1941. Cawthorne Road Valley is originally planned. The Governor Lord Liverpool however officially opened the step on Dominion Day which was 20th of September 1913 before a large 
crowd. Cuthran was thanked by the mayor, William Locke, who referred to him as Nelson's grand old man. Generous gift was recorded by or on the first landing in a slab of dark polished Aberdeen granite with the wording, These debts were presented to the city by Thomas Cuthran, which you'll see hopefully in the image that I've got. Less than a year later, World War One broke out and over the next five years, the church debt featured prominently in a succession of gatherings. Nelson farewell trip welcomed injured servicemen home, decorated a soldier for bravery at Gallipoli and held many fundraisers for the war efforts that centred on the church steps. The annual Dan Daffodil Day and Flower Queen Festival culminated com at the steps and provided the war-weary city and province with a splash of brightness for a few days each year. The first Anzac Day service was held in 1916 to remember the fallen of Gallipoli and subsequently all those who died in the various theatres of war before the armistice of November 1918 allowed a mass celebration. This was then followed in July 1919 with a gathering to mark the signing of a peace treaty called the Treaty of Versailles. War over the region was good use made good use of the steps to celebrate throughout the 1920s highlighting were two royal visits first in 1920 by Edward Prince of Wales who was then abdicated in 1936 who was in New Zealand for a four week tour and the second one was in 1927 by the Duke and Duchess of York late uh, George VI and Queen Elizabeth parents of the current Queen Elizabeth II. Prince of Wales charmed the crowd that was gathered at the steps to welcome him but wrote home in less than, than complimentary terms of a dance held in his honour in the city in which he had to lug those wilds, waves of ham faced women around although sick we were all feeling very wary and thoroughly peaked. Much loved Duchess of York fell ill shortly after the royal reception on the steps and spent several days in the city recuperating while her husband continued his tour. In 1921 the Governor General Viscount Jellicoe addressed a large crowd on the steps with during was about the country's loyalty to the empire during the war. When the dark clouds of war again broke in the year of 1939, the church steps drew large crowds once more to farewell troops and in 1942 the Victoria Cross was presented on the steps to Sergeant Alfred Holm for a series of hero acts during the Battle of Crete. The end of hostilities in Europe, VE Day, in May 1945 saw thousands gather on the steps and along Trafalgar Street but it was VJ Day victory over Japan in August that year that saw many joyous scenes as the city celebrated peace in the Pacific. An equally ecstatic crowd estimated to be 8,000 in number welcomed the visit by the hero of the Battle of Al Alamein, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery or as his nickname Monty during his tour of Australia and New Zealand to visit the soldiers who fought alongside. In 1942 the province's centennial was celebrated a bait in somewhat new to fashion and preparation. Two decorative gardens on the steps were replaced with viewing balconies. The plaque commemorating Thomas Cawthorn was then moved to the face of the second landing and the lower viewing balcony was fitted with a sculpted marble centennial memorial depicting the early European settlers 100 years after the founding of Nelson. The 1950s saw Nelson celebrate the 150th anniversary of Trafalgar Day on the steps as well as the visit of the Governor General Sir Bernard Cyril Freiburg, a hero of World War I and the commander of World War II. It was also de the decade in which the first reigning monarch visited New Zealand. The newly crowned Queen Elizabeth II and her husband Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh carved the way through a large and enthusiastic crowd on the steps as they walked from the service held in the cathedral to their hotel on Trafalgar Street in January 1953. However, the 1950s were also when the steps became the focus of widespread public protests between 1952 and 1955. Numerous public rallies were staged there and then ultimately unsuccessful bid to save Nelson's railway. The protests continued through the 1960s and 70s and on to into the 80s. Huge crowds congregated in 1962 to protest the government's amendment of the cotton mill at Stoke, while a decade later anti-apartheid marches up Trafalgar Street culminated at the steps. In 1981, police riot squads collapsed clashed with crowds during anti springbok rugby tour demonstration in 1982 Nelson Yen again marched to the steps to demonstrate their desire for a nuclear free world. Today the church steps continue to be the rallying point for public demonstrations on a wide range of social, social political and environmental issues. But it wasn't only just for protests that were staged on the steps. They are still used for celebrations, receptions, commemorations and discourse. From official receptions for dignitaries and political rallies to services to mark military anniversaries and occasions including Trafalgar Day and Anzac Day the steps are the perfect backdrop for formal occasions. They are also a popular meeting point for friends, young and old, a place to sit and eat lunch or just to simply to rest your weary feet. A vantage point from which to show visitors the city and they remain the most direct route from town to the cathedral. From brass band competitions, arts and music festivals and the start to finish of sporting events to the highly popular Carlos by Candlelight sessions held since at least the 1960s, the spectacular Peaky My audio visual light show in which Nelson's history was projected onto the steps in cathedral during the 2011 
Women Arts Festival and the mass haka resoundingly performed by Nelson College students on the steps at the start of the 2011 Rugby World Cup along with the recreation of the first game of rugby. The church steps remain the city's most prominent and popular landmark. Ownership of the church steps was transferred to the Nelson City Council in 1922 by the Nelson Diocesan Trust Board. Over the years, various modifications has been made to them including the removal of gardens and trees from various locations, the addition of the Nelson Centennial Memorial, removal of the flagpole and certain lamps on a number of pillars and the provision of the two street lamps. However, the steps generally retain the original the original planning, scale and design and are the integral part of the pub that will wide up and around Church Hill and Northern Access to Christchurch Cathedral. From a historical point of view, with the steps that are a strong visit symbol of the ongoing use of Church Hill Piki Mai by both Pakia and Māori. So this basically is a brief overview as you can see here right now based on the history of the church steps that I've got hopefully a few pictures in that to add here and there as well as maybe the map or what have you to share with you all where you can find this monumental piece that still is existing today along with that church that I mentioned earlier in the piece so sit tight and relax and I'll bring out those and I'll be back with you short memorial of to the fallen in Nelson this memorial is located to the west of the church steps on the cathedral hill it pays homage to those who died during World War One and that in the years of 1914 to the 1918 a list of those who died and were living within Nelson's boundaries as they were at that day can be found on the city centre park in Anzac Park those who came from Stoke are listed on the Stoke Memorial Hall gate and those from Waka Pua Puaka are listed on a memorial at the Waka Puaka Memorial Hall Memorial to the Fallen in the Boer War a movable plaque sits at the entrance to the South and Nelson Cathedral and complements the Boer War statue that sits within the Queen's Gardens only 13 names has shown on the memorial not really reflecting the loss of life of the New Zealanders in this conflict. Men across Nelson were part of the many contingents of mounted rifles who went away and the dead may not have been registered as being from Nelson but from a wider South Island attachment. The memorial tablet reads erected by the public school children of Nelson province in memory of the troopers from this district who lost their lives in the South African War 1899 to 1902. Lennon Matthews Heron, Philip Costa Best, Francis Howell, John Nayon Lan, John Hawksworth, Ralph Vincent James, William Aubrey Jennings, George Hyde, Ernest George Ems, George C. D. Fowler, Joseph Precy Roberts, Robert Ernest Anzo, Sidney C. Harford, Dolce E. Decorum, S. Pro Patria Mori. In 1897, the first New Zealand contingent has been taken overseas as part of the Diamond Jubilee celebrations in London. Many signed up for their armed forces as a result of the Jubilee fever. These soldiers were sent to the Boer War, which then started in 1899 of October, 12th of October, and then it finished in 1902. They then went to South Africa to uphold the British flag in South Africa and gave their lives during 1899 to 1902. Khaki uniforms were introduced at this time for New Zealand soldiers. The funds for providing this memorial was raised, were raised by means of a penny subscription from the children attending the school in the Nelson district and consequently there was a good attendance of young people to witness the ceremony including the central school cadets when it was unveiled by his lordship the Bishop of Nelson assisted by the Reverend J.P. Kempthorne at the time. Again, you'll see an image hopefully above me as well as a map where you can find the centerpiece of the statue in the description box below.